so I'm back. Um, my first video got a sizable response relative to the videos that I usually post. And I have a lot of story left to tell, so I hope I can tell it. Um, I'm probably going to put a background picture on this video instead of just black and a ball, but that's that ball is pretty cool in the first video. I'm gonna do cool things with the um, the what you call it? The I don't know what to call that. A visualizer? It's called the visualizer, but and uh, you know, there's a uh, there's a program dedicated to creating music visualizers called Vovoid VSXU. It's free, and uh, I have absolutely no idea how such a specialized software exists, but it does exist. Anyways, um, I was talking about my, uh, my story. Um, one of the things that you have to remember while listening to my story is that I'm not trying to get anyone to believe me. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. All I'm doing is explaining my experiences in a way that will be entertained, probably, maybe enlighten a little bit. So I left off last time when I was uh, first using EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. You can look that up if you want. You can look it up. Oh, and this song is uh, Deep Blue by Ben Sound. It's free. You probably won't hear this one on YouTube videos very often because it doesn't really suit the, the normal stuff that you use Ben Sound music for. Like, uh, if you've ever watched any videos by Daily News, Funny Picks, you know, like 10 plus disgusting things that people have done, they use music from Ben Sound. And uh, it's kind of annoying, actually. Once you recognize the track, it smells of broke. And I I'm broke. I do like this music, though. Anyways, so... Uh, I was using EMDR on myself. And delving deep into my own brain. Having visions. I had... I still have visions today. They're not as pronounced because of my... Uh, my medication, which is Clozabril or Clozapine, it's the best antipsychotic medication out there. I mean, I'll go on a tangent here, but uh, most antipsychotic medication is about as effective as the rest. You know, there are, the only reason why there are multiple antipsychotics is because they have different effects on different people. So if you don't respond well to one antipsychotic, you'll respond to another. If you don't respond to Invega, you respond to Latuda. If you don't respond to Latuda, you respond to Olanzapine, Seroquel, Lithium, uh, Zyprexa, and uh, all those medications have bad side effects too, but the one medication that um, is much more powerful than the others, I think like double the effectiveness, is called Clozaril. The only reason why it's not prescribed universally is because there's a dangerous side effect where it reduces your white blood cell count drastically. And so you have to get blood tests every week when you're on Clozaril, at least for the first six months of use. After that it goes down to bi-monthly and then just once a month. Um, Clozaril is an old drug, it's a second generation drug, we're at the third generation now. The first generation drugs are bad, they're like Haldol and stuff like that. They caused the, uh, the shakes, Parkinson's-like syndromes, no one uses those anymore. There are three generations of antipsychotic drugs and, uh, two categories. Um, common, uh, uh, um, I forget the terminology, but there's one class of antipsychotic drugs like the Frontline uses, and the uh, there's a second class. You know what, you can look it up if you want. I'm, I'm going... <laughs> I think my tangent 
is over. So this was before I was officially diagnosed. I used EMDR on myself and uh, overcame a lot of my internal personal problems. For example, self-hatred. I don't have any self-hatred. Fear of death. I don't have any fear of death. Internal trauma. There, are, I don't have any memories that I hate to watch because this is how EMDR works. You uh, start with the beginning of a traumatic memory, and while you're re reliving the memory in your head, you move your hand side to side, binaural stimulation. And um, what happens is that the memory becomes less powerful. You know how everyone has memories that when they think about them, they cringe or they get scared. It's PTSD. Everybody has at least some amount of PTSD. Because even messing up a important presentation during a school contest can qualify as minor post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, or like a skiing accident, or your parents fighting, or you know, seeing someone die, that's, that's traumatic. And uh, EMDR gets rid of that stuff. And uh, a person's um, defense mechanisms or uh, maladaptive, uh, maladaptive behaviors and thoughts are usually based on traumas received as a child. And I got rid of that stuff. I'm not entirely certain how different I am from normal people, but I am different. Uh, my, my psyche is different. When I'm not psychotic, I am very um, open-minded about things. Anyway, so EMDR caused me to realize that I had a lot of anger in my heart. And so what I did was, I, this was level one, what I did was I screamed as loud as I could and said whatever I wanted. And um, this was just a month after I got kicked out of my dad's house. My parents are divorced. My father lives in California. He kicked me out and said he never wanted to see me again. And I haven't talked to him in five or six years. Um, I think that added to the fact of my br that I broke down. Anyways, so I yelled and I screamed, and at first my parents didn't know what was going on. It all culminated in, uh, I mean, I wanted to experience, I wanted to basically live. You know, I'd walk out in the rain and just enjoy the rain on my skin. It was a very, very cathartic moment. And uh, I, I would talk to my grandfather, who went through the same thing that I did, but a little bit differently. But And uh, he understood, he said... You're becoming, you're becoming enlightened, but this is just the first step. It's just first base, and I still believe that I'm, I'm not even past second base as far as enlightenment goes. Enlightenment is a very long journey. There are some things that you understand that are impossible to communicate concretely to people who are not enlightened, and so the, one of the purposes of this new series is that I'm going to try and enlighten you, which is a very tough, difficult, um, it's a very difficult, very, you know, it's not something that, so, the Buddhists, how they convey enlightenment from one person to another, is they drop hints, and people pick up on these hints, and synthesize them, and figure out on their own the, the the realities of enlightenment. I call it enlightenment because I have no other word for it. More like awakening. Anyways, uh, again, I must say that I've never used drugs, though I do think drugs like LSD and DMT would really help me. Uh, f not physically, but like, they would open my eyes and let me see what I've been trying to see. Anyways, so I, this, my screaming, my screaming time, the whole time I deliberately chose to scream. 
I screamed loud, I cussed, I stomped, I cried, I was just, I was just letting out all of my emotions, and my parents were scared, and, um, it all culminated in a, in a two hour long screaming session at my church. I screamed at my pastor, who at that time had known us for only about a month, because we just moved from California, and, uh, I just yelled at him, I, I just screamed at him, I said, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, and, like, I want to have sex with you, and, like, fuck, he was, he was a male preacher, I'm not gay, but I said whatever I wanted to say, I started screaming and visualizing, and, and then after that, after that experience, my mind was blank, and calm, and black, I mean, I still, I don't know what to think about that episode. I honestly don't. I don't know if I did the right thing. I don't know if it actually helped me in the end. But uh, it was like, you know, like iteration one of my um, self-improvement quest. Iteration one. Uh, now, nowadays, I realize that if I ever have any anger, uh, I can open up a valve inside of me and it just all oh, but the thing is it really like it, it, it's psychologically painful to open an anger valve and let all the anger out but it's a very direct very tactile experience if I'm feeling angry and everyone does that sometimes uh, instead of waiting for myself to calm down I, I've practiced this, it's a very difficult technique, especially if you're new to it, but what you do is you just release the anger, or any other emotion really. If you have any sort of emotion that you don't want, you open up a valve in your body, and the emotion spills out. It. I, I liken the experience to falling like jumping off a cliff it feels like you're, you're jumping off a cliff when you release your anger before you do it you're standing on a precipice and you don't want to go over the edge but you just have to take the plunge unlock your anger and just let it go like you, you have this anger in you and it's a physical it's an experience. It's, it's it's like a little pool of liquid emotion inside of you, and if and if you release the pressure valves. Oh wait a second, my uh. Whatever. If I just skipped over something, right then it's because my uh my my, my recording software just glitched. Anyway, so anger. How you release it is you deliberately, you don't say, I don't want to be angry. You deliberately just go and feel that anger, and then you open it. You, you, you crack it open, and it just goes, Whoosh. and it feels horrible. It feels absolutely horrible. It's one of the most, it's one of the most difficult feelings in the world, actually. Much more difficult than the actual anger. Um, and I, lear I learned this technique recently, um, but before that, I had to, like, blow my anger off like a volcano, or at least I experimented with that. Um, there was this girl that I, uh, that I met at band camp a week before, and I was texting her, and uh, I was opening myself up to the opportunities of being enlightened, and I kind of scared her. I not, not really in the sense of being creepy. More of in the sense of talking too much about direct things that people don't really like to talk about. For example, um, you know, their, their problems and their... I'll probably explain more about what how, how people react to my directness and my, my... My scalpel, so to speak, of... It wasn't very refined back then, but anyways, my parents took my phone away because they said I was being weird, not really being weird, but more like overwhelming. They took my phone away, and I got really angry, and I wanted it back, 
and I got so angry. I didn't get angry, per se. I wasn't angry. I felt trapped, not angry. It wasn't like the anger you feel when you, you, you get mad. It was the it was the feeling of being claustrophobically squeezed into a box, and I had to get out. I had to scream my way out of this claustrophobic box. Because my family it was a claustrophobic box, really. My, uh, my, my whole family lives and lived in, and still lives in the sort of, like, claustrophobic, very expectant, um, difficult to manage, and just generally terrible feeling in atmosphere, you know? My, my stepdad, he's, he's really abrasive, and he takes things personally all the time. Like this morning, I was sweeping the house, and I bumped into him, lightly, and the broom tapped him. I, maybe it hurt him more than I know, because his back is bad, but he got really mad at me, and he took it personally, and, it, and, it, and he's still not over it. I mean, when he when he dropped me off at uh, school today, he didn't, he didn't say anything, he just... I, I don't understand how someone can be as petty as... Him. If, he, if he's listening, I doubt he is, but I doubt you are, but I mean, I think you're petty. I, I think he's petty. He takes everything personally. And the thing is, he doesn't take things personally when they're coming from my mother or my stepbrother. So his son and his wife can do all sorts of things that I wouldn't get away with. And it's always been this way. It's It's been this way since they got married. I mean, I'm I'm the second class son, and uh, my brother Daniel he's he's at college now he doesn't live with us anymore was the third class son he he took a lot of the brunt of like for example uh, Daniel did not like cheese I, I don't know why I called him his real name but uh, you, you won't find him he's a uh, it's a common name he didn't like cheese and so they tried to force feed him cheese and my brother Daniel spat the cheese out onto the kitchen floor, vomited it, and my stepfather made him lick it off the ground. It was probably one of the worst nights of his life, and a very bad night for me. And, you know, he, his... He never really understood moderation in, um, anyways, his, and my mother was kind of blind to that. She let it happen, which is why, which is why I kind of had to understand why she let it happen. I kind of had to understand how people work when they're not enlightened in order to deal with it. Before I understood that my mother and my stepfather and most of the people I know are not enlightened, I mean, this enlightenment I'm talking about isn't some sort of spiritual fulfillment. This enlightenment I'm talking about is the ability to trace your own intentions back to their source and be honest with yourself. I don't like people being dishonest with themselves, saying I love you when they act like they hate you, you know, playing favorites, obviously playing favorites between your biological son and your stepson, obviously playing favorites, it's always been obvious. Um, just a second here, I have to, uh, um, f figure out, anyways. I um I had I had to cut the I had to cut what I was going with in order to extend the music time because I'm playing music as I as I talk anyways I don't think my life was as bad as some people's but I'm a very sensitive person I'm very sensitive to people's emotions and their intentions and uh, my mother she she's blind she is emotionally blind and my stepfather takes everything too personally. It's like walking on eggshells around him. And, and my mother does nothing about it because he's very nice to her. Because, here's the thing, 
My stepfather does not work. He, he technically works, but he does dom he, he he fixes up houses that we buy and anyways, the thing is he has no income and spends a lot of my mother's money. My mother is a high figure earner. She earned six figures as a Harvard educated lawyer. And my stepfather spends all that money on his own pet projects which some are justifiable in the sense that you could probably write them off for your taxes but he, he, he does what he wants he used to work as a paralegal at the same law firm that my mother worked at he also worked as a paralegal at Chase and he was a lot meaner then but he, he still I'm happy that he's not stressed because when he's stressed he's worse but I still don't like the fact that he gets to do what he wants all day long even if it is technically work without having it's a very complicated experience but I'll give you an example uh, John wanted a new car and he just asked my mom can we buy this new car? And he already had a car. He already had two cars. And she said, sure, why not? And she gave him 5,000 bucks, bought a car. We haven't used it once since we bought it four or five years ago. It's still sitting in the garage. I don't know why. And there's things like that. He buys a lot of guns with my mother's money. I just don't like that. And this, 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 this feeling was unexpressible in my house. This feeling of being underneath the feet of my stepfather while my mother was pretended not to notice, really didn't notice, didn't care. So I was, it was very, it was very stuffy feeling. I felt stuffed, like I was stuffed into a, a... I was just stuffed, and I had to break out by screaming and yelling and cussing and trying to make them understand. At first, I didn't scream. At the very beginning, I just took my problems and I tried to confront them. I said, this is what you guys are doing wrong, this is what I think you should be doing, and they did not handle it well. And so I just had to keep escalating and seeing how far I could go. They never understood, they haven't understood, they still don't understand. But I realize that you don't overtly change people. You have to be very subtle if you want to change your environment, if it's controlled by people who are more powerful than you. You don't say, you're doing this wrong, this is how you do it. You, you, you do, do a little something I call uh, fiddling with the dynamic. It's a very difficult road but you you gotta you gotta react right to what they say you gotta stay off certain topics you gotta you gotta you gotta maneuver your way around the family structure and I'm still I still live with my parents although in a trailer on the property because frankly I am a very lazy person not because I don't like work I've written 13 books and I, I do all sorts of stuff but because I don't like the feeling of time passing slowly. That is my utmost hatred. I hate that feeling. When I'm working a dead-end job, standing there, waiting. And I worked at a coffee shop for like two weeks. I couldn't handle it. I can't handle work. Because it's, just, it's difficult. I don't understand how other people are able to work like this. I never understood how people are able to work. Never. I mean, I hope I find a job that does me well. I want to be a professional author because I love writing, and writing is the kind of work I like doing. But uh, I've sold one copy of one of my 13 books in the past year online, and maybe five or six copies physically, person to person. So, there you have it. Let's get back to the EMDR. I um, 
I figured myself out, although I had to deal with my unbalanced psyche because I had been using fantasy to balance my psychological well-being. That's the main purpose of fantasizing about girls, money, love, or boys if you're a girl or a gay person, but the point of fantasy is to fulfill emotional needs that aren't met in reality. And once you get rid of those fantasy elements inside your brain, your psyche becomes... You have withdrawal symptoms. Your psyche becomes unbalanced. And it's taken me a long time, plus medication, to balance my psyche. I don't fantasize. I don't talk to myself. I, I do talk to myself. But there's, there's, I, I mentioned in the other video, my previous video, that there are voices in your head that are manifestations of your childhood experiences, usually your parents, and I've gotten rid of those voices. It was difficult. No one, no one understood what I was doing. I understood what I was doing from the very beginning, but I was unable to articulate it until, like, now. I'm articulating it now as best as I've ever articulated it. And um, the reason why I got in so much trouble is because I was unable to understand my situation and unable to articulate what I wanted to say. And now that I understand and can articulate, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, you know, like shy, gun shy about articulating it. I, mean, I used to really want to communicate stuff to people, but now I can't. I can't. It's difficult. Um, it's about time that I wrap this up. My, I'm, I'm making these videos half an hour, usually. Um, I don't know if there's going to be one coming up on Sunday. I, I, can't, I don't have internet access on Sunday, so I'll upload something. Or maybe I'll schedule a, a second video to go up on Sunday. But uh, This is just the very beginning. I've got a long way to go. My throat is hurting. So... I may as well just uh, cut it off here after another couple minutes, and I gotta finish wrapping up what I was saying. Anyways, my parents they got they got really uh, they scared they got scared. I'm screaming loudly. They brought me to a behavioral health clinic. I had a date with the girl I was talking about, but it was you know I was at the behavioral health clinic when I was there. Behavioral health clinic, by the way, is where they put um, kids who, who have not done you know like felons, but like, you know, the, the drug rehab. It was basically like a rehab center for kids. You know, and I met some interesting people there. Uh, at the time, I had this theory that I had discovered Nirvana, which which I have, but it's not, it's not the way you think it is. Like, for example, Nirvana, most people, when they think of Nirvana, think of, like, the hum kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? But Nirvana is just an understanding that you are yourself, you are not anyone else, and there is no importance vested in anything but your knowledge of yourself. And that's not a feeling of word, that is a state of mind. And what it does is it helps you see other people in their whole entirety. It helps you understand events and politics and everything. You understand that all these people don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it. Nirvana is the understanding. You understand why you do things. I understand why I get angry. I understand why I get sad. I understand why I'm going to die. Nirvana is the state of mind that comes with complete and total understanding of yourself and others. That's Nirvana. I used to think it was biological because of all the feelings I had in my body. I used to call it total neurological control. It's not total neurological control, now I know this. It's total psychological control. You control your psyche. Total and complete, not control, more like 
capitalist, you know, like, uh, you let your mind do what it wants, and that's it. Um, and I, I reached Nirvana stage one. Now I'm at, like, Nirvana stage 12, but there's hundreds of stages of Nirvana of enlightenment, and I'm, I'm not even close to the end. Um, I think one of the things, in order to advance up the enlightenment ladder, you have to have students, actually. This just came to me, but if you're unable to articulate your own thoughts, they, aren't, they don't mean as much, and you have to have students in order to articulate to them, and in doing so, advance yourself. That's sort of what I'm doing here, and I'll give you a little teaser about what I really want to achieve with this, uh, a telepathic world where people can meet, talk, and play games as if they're on the internet. So, you know, like telepathic web pages, telepathic telepathic video games, you know, like telepathic MMORPGs, using LSD as a video game console. That's that's the world I want to create, which is but no one understands that that's that's a very concrete goal. And uh my end my my the end result of what I want to do with any all of this is to create a telepathic MMORPG. And like real MMORPGs, telepathic MMORPGs take a lot of people, a lot of work, a lot of different perspectives. And uh, you guys are nowhere near, unless you've already watched this series from the top, but you guys are nowhere near developing developing status. I'm probably going to build a dev kit and hand it out, but in the end, um, I have something that I want to communicate, and I'm going to try to communicate it. And if I can't, I can't. I'll probably make another video at some point. I thank you for listening, and I hope you have a good day. Like, subscribe, etc.